Louisiana ex-pastor Jerry DeWitt became an atheist after 25 years of Pentecostal ministry. After preaching in Beauregard Parish since the age of 17, he decided to quit and took a job as a public building inspector. But when his family and friends discovered he'd lost his faith, he became an outcast in his own hometown. Since then, DeWitt has become a strong supporter of non-religious communities. His book, Hope After Faith, chronicles his conversion from a Bible Belt pastor to atheist leader. Jerry DeWitt joins me now. Jerry, thanks so much for being here with us today. We've got your book, Hope After Faith. Jerry, uh, take me to that moment when you went from being a believer to a non-believer. Well, first off, thanks for uh, having me, and I am thrilled that you got so much right with that introduction. Uh, <laughs> okay. <surprise. laughs> You'd be surprised how many different ways the story gets told, so thank you. You got it all right. That's wonderful. Uh, I wish I could take you to the moment um, that I really realized that I was no longer a believer of any degree. It, it, it happened over the course of, of 25 years. Of course, the very last couple of years were the most important. Um, but there is a particular moment that I, I truly knew that I was not a believer and that almost more importantly to me, that I was no longer going to be able to function as a minister. And, and it, was, it was a night when I had received a request for uh, a young lady that I knew very well had called for prayer and I was not able to pray for her. My conscience wouldn't allow me to pray for her. And when I hung up the phone, I knew at that moment that I not only was a non-believer, but, uh, but also, and this may sound strange to your audience, but that I also could not be in the ministry anymore. And that, at that point in my life, was, was the hardest pill to swallow. And I wonder what the reaction uh, has been. I grew up, as I, I tell people, I grew up Pentecostal. My dad was actually a Baptist minister, which caused uh, a very uh, odd childhood in many ways, because as you know, I mean, they're just very different, uh, very different. Uh, denominations and, and sort of approaches to religions. Uh, what has the reaction in your town been? I mean, you're essentially what we would call in the Pentecostal faith a, a backslider. Yeah, well, they they hope I'm a backslider. A lot yeah, of that's right, hope, and that that's right. Yeah, yeah. As long as they can categorize me as a backslider, then there's still hope, and their prayers aren't in vain, and and my life story isn't in vain, uh, in you know, in their minds. So yes, to to lots of people, I'm a backslider. To some people, I'm the enemy, uh, a turncoat, almost like uh, an American soldier suddenly being found working for Al Qaeda. It's uh, it can be wow. seen something that serious. And then for a lot of people, I'm no longer, I'm a mute point. I'm no longer an issue. Uh, I like to describe it as a polite hostility. You know, they may see me in traffic and nod. They may see me in town and nod. But, but it's obvious that the draw uh, to speak to me, to fellowship with me is, is no longer there. In some ways, it's, it's actually repelled. So I've lost family. I've lost friends. It's been a, a very isolating experience indeed. But you decided to stay anyhow. It, I did. I did. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I question that decision every day. But, um, but, but, but first off, I didn't know that my wife would leave um, a few months after all of this broke loose. And so I was desperately trying to save our home. We, we had bought the home a few years earlier and felt like it was a member of the family. It was a large and important moment in our lives. And so to have lost the job, to have lost favor in the community, to have lost family and friends, to also lose the home was just one step too far. And then on top of that, I, I, I begin to discover that almost everyone in my situation eventually has to move in order to start their life over. And I just thought, that's just unnecessary. I'm not a convicted criminal. I'm not a convicted child molester. Right. I, I have nothing to be ashamed of. I shouldn't have to move. And so we've battled it out. Uh, my wife has, has returned home. We're reestablishing our relationship. And so I'm going oh, wow. to do this before it's over. All righty. Well, you will have to keep us up to date on, on that, how that goes. I want sure. to uh, turn now, uh, Peter Bogosian, and he's a philosophy professor at Portland State. I'm sure you know his work. Uh, he gave 
a talk, Jesus, the Easter Bunny, and other delusions, uh, just say no, and that was a talk he gave last year. Here is what he had to say uh, about faith. If one belongs to a faith tradition, one can and should scrutinize one faith, one's faith with the same tools of reason and by the same standards used to evaluate and reject other faiths. But people don't. Why would one not see one's faith delusions as delusions? I wonder if you could talk about how you see your faith, the faith you had. I mean, do you see it as a delusion? Um, do I see it as a delusion? I, I guess you could use that definition. I see it as a misconception. I see it as, as misguidance. But I see it as the only tool uh, that I was given very early as a child. Some of my earliest memories is actually laying my head on my grandmother's lap with her praying for an earache and speaking in other tongues. So, so literally some of my earliest memories is hearing someone speak in other tongues. And so this, this, this creates who you are. This creates the way that you look at life. It, it creates your worldview. And so I, I, I don't like the harsh language, and maybe I don't like it because it would reflect back on me as well, but to investigate one's faith as intensely as the philosopher would suggest is to kind of miss the point of one's faith. And so, um, so I, I, I just don't, I don't look at it as negatively as some people do. Okay. Um, do you believe in Jesus as a, as a historical figure? Oh, wow. That's a great question. You know, I, I've got people that I respect on both sides of the argument. And so I don't have any way of knowing if Jesus was a historical figure. Uh, it looks, the evidence now looks as if he most likely was not. But uh, that's one of those areas I have to be agnostic about. You know, I, I know that I don't know. Talk now, I will say this. If the Jesus that I was raised up to believe in, if that Jesus actually did exist, uh, I would I would be glad that he did. Rather and, than sort of the Jesus that, that people interpret him as and, and use his uh, words and, and sort of teachings in the Bible as a wedge issue in some ways. Right. In, in modernity, by, by, by the majority of believers, um, the Jesus concept is a very beautiful, elegant, and, and useful concept. And so, uh, unfortunately, especially in the Deep South, with fundamentalism, we we take it to an extreme and, and we misuse the concept in many ways that creates limitations and, uh, and creates policies, even governmental policies that are detrimental to other people and other people's lifestyles. So if we could back way up and just have this, this beautiful idea of Jesus, well, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. I want to go there. You were in a Reddit discussion. Someone going by the name Heathen Born uh, said, since you weren't sure about God and then changed your mind, are you sure you won't change your mind about atheism and go back to God? Your response was, I try not to be sure about anything. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I came up with this little creed for, for a total different reason, but it, it really expresses where I'm at at this point in my life. I say that skepticism is my nature, and looking back over my history, and I, I, I detail it in my memoir, you can see that I, I have been pretty skeptical. That's my nature. Free thought, I now try to apply that as a methodology of looking at the world. But agnosticism is, is really my conclusion to 25 years of religious study. I know there are things I don't know. So on top of that, I now say, atheism is my opinion. And, and opinions do change. And I'm, I'm not going to say that I know for sure that something does or does not exist that appears to be unprovable. But the important fact for me in my life, the end of that creed then says, but humanism is my motivation. So I've realized that throughout my entire life, throughout my entire ministry, it was a love for truth, a love for people, and this humanistic uh, uh, set of values that propelled me into the ministry in the first place. So I no longer feel obligated to say what I know and don't know for sure. Is it your sense that there is any middle ground here? I mean, when I think about your story, you went from Pentecostalism, which is a very fundamental faith, and I know that firsthand, uh, and then you went to the other extreme, what some people say is an extreme, uh, atheism. Sure. Is there any sort of middle ground? Yes, I, I think a lot of people live a middle ground. Um, I, unfortunately, was not one of the people who could do that for two reasons. One, my personality drove me uh, in the direction that I went. And, and number two, because I was a minister and I held the responsibility of proclaiming the doctrine, right. 
that that forced me to look at things differently. Had I just been sitting in the pew, quite honestly, I'd probably still be enjoying church right now. I just would be one of those people who quietly, maybe a silent or closeted atheist sitting on a pew somewhere. But I do think there's middle ground, and I think people people obtain middle ground in a lot of different ways, whether it's a very liberal form of Christianity or it's some form of a quote-unquote, you know, uh, spiritualism. Yeah. Some, I think people are, are, are trying to do that. What's important to me is not necessarily the labels that people use or whether or not they're able to enjoy certain forms of mythology in their life and use it for tools. What's important to me is what they do in the voting booth and how they treat their children. That's, that's what ends up being important to me because that, that affects the innocent and that affects all of our futures. Jerry DeWitt, the book is Hope After Faith, an ex-pastor's journey from belief to atheism. Your church, if we can call it that, is Community Mission Chapel. Thank you so much for joining me today, sir, and good luck with your marriage, uh, with your, with your uh, family. Oh, we're, we're going to be all right. We're, we're going to prove this is doable. All righty. Take care. That's it for our show today. Thanks to our guests, Sanderson Jones and Jerry DeWitt. We're taking this conversation back to the Twitters where we have been debating the point of churches for non-believers. Tell us what you think with that hashtag post back. And tomorrow marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Join us for our special coverage. We'll see you then. <laughs>